Thank you so Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Every time I come here, it just is absolutely wonderful. And so I'd like to thank, right from the start, Bipin Chetan and Gita Cheche for putting on a, yet another wonderful conference. Um, and thank you, everyone, for all the hard work that you put into to, uh, making these sort of conferences. It's wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about drug discovery. There's a clear, urgent need for new medicines for uh, combating bacteria, and so I thought I'd talk about some of the techniques that we're using in the lab. And I just thought I'd start with kind of where we're at. And so just looking through some of the Nature Reviews drug discovery journal sort of comments and so on, and unfortunately in, in, uh, in Big Pharma and in R&D, we're suffering from um, Arum's law, where this is the amount of money we spend on drugs, and this is the amount of drugs, so it's drugs per billion dollars, and we're going downwards. It's the opposite of Moore's law that we see in, in computing. Uh, so we sort of got to, this is the trend. Um, and so we're trying to see, can we combat that? Can we get more drugs out uh, for cheaper? And also, when we look at the diseases, um, this is at the later stages of drug discovery. So we're sort of getting into clinical trials here. Um, and you're only getting something like a 4% success rate. I mean, this is a very expensive thing to do, phase one, phase two. We're talking tens of millions of dollars in your success rate, um, industrial average of 4.1%. Okay, so that's a lot of money being wasted. Good news is, here at MRSA, we're about the average. If you pick some other diseases like Alzheimer's, your success rate is 0.5%. Um, I'm working with some neurodegenerative disease people, and actually, we think they've got the wrong model. Uh, we actually think it's oxidative stress is the key thing. I, I'm not going to get too sidetracked on that. But what I would like to point out is sort of where we go wrong. And, and remarkably, 30%, and this is in the clinical trial phase, 30% of failures are due to lack of efficacy. They don't work. Okay? And then another 39% are failing at pharmacokinetics. We really shouldn't be doing pharmacokinetics down here. 39%. So you add these two up and you're more than two-thirds of the failures is because the drug doesn't work and it's got poor pharmacokinetics. So you certainly want to include things like pharmacokinetics. I was just discussing with one of my esteemed colleagues that really you want this ideas of pharmacokinetics coming right up in the beginning of your structural biology, uh, in the case of my case, of, of your, um, your drug discovery, just so you can try and get better success through your pipeline. Moreover, Discovering a drug, uh, it's going to take you typically something like 15 years, okay, remarkable amount of time. And this is, again, a Nature Reviews drug discovery um, article, and actually it's wrong. They're saying we're starting off with 10,000 compounds. Most companies don't start with 10,000 companies to discover a drug. They'll probably do a high-throughput screen, and they'll start with something like a million compounds. We heard from Dr. Nizay using uh, Roche's library of 800,000 compounds. And what we're going to end up with is may maybe, if we're lucky, one compound that makes it through to FDA approval. Now, I'm a... Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say. Did I say here? Oh, yeah. So the big pharma companies, they spend... I'm just curious. We heard yesterday about the amount of research in the town hall. We were in the town hall, and I was just talking about the monies being thrown around in R&D. And so, yeah, I looked, and it's like the top 15 pharmaceutical companies spend each... Two to nine billion dollars a year in R and D, and I think it's Pfizer at 9.1 billion dollars a year. And so, what I want to do is see: can I improve this? And this is the uh, translational aspects of my research. I'm an academic scientist, so we're still solving structures, trying to figure out functions. But we're now having quite a strong translational aspect to the research in my lab. And I'm just sort of asking: hey, can we use all these very cool new modern structural biology techniques to? more rapidly get through this drug discovery uh, pipeline and using less compounds. And the way I'm going to do that, or the way we are doing that, is just taking some very new approaches, really structural biology, lever leveraging all the new breakthroughs in structural biology, and also using chemical biology, developing new chemical tools to say, can we find a good target? Can we get some idea of its efficacy? Can we do drug discovery when we're designing the drugs that hopefully have good pharmacokinetics uh, right in the beginning? Um, and we're doing this in an academic and a translational setting. In terms of academia, we're developing chemical tools to understand protein functions. And there's a nice little paper we had uh, back in 2014 in molecular cell uh, 
showing that we could use chemical tools to look at an enzyme and just in, uh, uh, stop various aspects of its activity and figure out what activity or what part of the activity do, does what in, in cellular pathways. Um, I also thought I'd just put this slide up. This is with Kang Zhang in Nature in 2015. I just mentioned it because uh, Dr. Nizay mentioned the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And we think that's super important. We think it's actually important for cataracts. And we find if you add in the precursors, lanisterol in particular, that actually reverses aggregation in cataracts. And so you can add in lanisterol as an eye drop based therapy uh, for removing cataracts, which I think has pretty profound implications, uh, particularly in India. Okay, so what does my lab do to do drug discovery? Um, so our first idea is just developing better drugs, and I can't lay credit to this. This is really my PhD supervisor's uh, genius, I would say, and that he developed a new technology of fragment-based ligand discovery. And what we're doing is we're trying to use fragments um, to quickly develop molecules. And so what I have is a library of fragments. I'll explain what they are in a second. But when I do my drug discovery of a protein, my library that I'm using is 450 compounds. So I've moved away from that 1 million compound high throughput screening to 450 compounds in my major library. Hey, that makes it viable. That makes it viable for a, a little academic lab to actually take on Big Pharma who, with their billions of dollars of research. So what fragments are is they're very small compounds, uh, something like 100 Daltons in your normal drug be like 500 Daltons, so they're like pieces, pieces of an organic molecule. Uh, but the nice thing is you can have a small library and cover a large amount of chemical space. And so we like that in particular, that we can just use a few compounds and rapidly look across chemical space. Um, and then the other reason is because chatting with friends and colleagues in Big Pharma, what they're telling me is that the compounds that they get through, through all the way through their drug development and that pass through the FDA and get into the clinic, are typically small compounds, the smaller compounds with the simpler chemistry. They're the ones that tend to have less off-site toxicities and so on. And with fragments, you can develop these smaller compounds with simpler chemistry. Also, it gives you novel IP space. Um, and then uh, another point is it reveal novel binding pockets. I'll explain that in a bit. So here's high throughput screening. I'm not against high throughput screening. Actually, we have a high throughput screening hit we're studying right now. We're excited about it. But certainly for me as an assistant professor at UCR, my startup budget would probably be blown in one big high throughput screen. If I've got one target, I want to screen you know, a million compounds, that's, that's certainly going to eat into my, into my startup funds. Um, and then also there's a few other issues with high throughput screening. So here's your hit from your high throughput screen, and it's hitting your protein target. But as you can see from the shapes, it doesn't really fit that well. And so what you have to do is typically a ton of chemistry to turn your hit from the high throughput screen that will have something like 10 micromolar uh, KD into something that has a low nanomolar KD. So you'll have to do a bunch of chemistry to modify this. And you certainly move away from the small molecule with the simple chemistry. You'll end up with a big molecule with a fairly complicated chemistry um, to turn this into a drug or a hit molecule that's drug-like. With my fragments, what I do is I take my protein, my protein crystal structure, and I just take my library of fragments, my 450 of them, and I just soak them into my protein, soak them into my crystal, and say, hey, do, do any of these fragments bind? And the thing is that not many bind. My success rate is something like 3 to 5%. So most don't bind. But the ones that do, they bind spectacularly. And the reason is is because they have something called ligand deficiency. So most of the atoms of that fragment will bind to the protein. And so you're up in something like 70 or 80% of your atoms in the fragment are binding to the protein. And that's why it can bind. If it's just one fragment, it's still a bad inhibitor. It's going to be something like 100 micromolar. But what you can do is you often leave that first fragment in there, and then you'll just say, great, I found one binding site. Why don't I just throw in more of my library? into the protein, and does anything bind nearby? And often it will, and then all you've got to do is figure out how can you chemically couple those two fragments together, and what you end up with is a very small molecule, often with very simple chemistry, that typically will have a KD in something like one to five nanomolar range. So it's become a very potent selective inhibitor. What I like about it, I'm sort of interested in the startup space, 
that this is typically a novel chemical entity. So you've created very nice, strong IP, and then you can work all around it. Um, you're not dealing with things like uh, a novel utility patent. You've got novel chemical entity, and you can develop a whole bunch more and really sort of cover patent space around there, which is good news if you want to sell the compound or, or start, do a startup. So the way I do that in my, my little lab is what we do is we take my library, and the first thing we do is actually this quick binding assay, super easy. Um, I'll explain that in a second. It's called a thermal shift assay. Um, and then we go into the more complex stuff of various sort of structural determination methods, the backbone of which is crystallography. Then I'll go into binding assays, the typical ones, ITC, MST, SPR, and so on, just to get measurements of binding affinities. And then I start collaborating. My lab's limits are at the in vitro level, and then I'll chat with the experts in cellular assays and in vivo assays. And I just want to highlight, I put this at the end, um, and, and I'm not trying to say it's not important. In fact, it, it really is important. And I think one of the competitive edges to my lab is that I'm being told by my collaborators in academia what are the novel therapeutic targets. And this is what Big Pharma may not know. And so, so the edge to my lab in terms of competing with someone with a billion dollar research budget is that he doesn't know, you know what, what to drug. And fortunately enough, I have great collaborations in, you know, in India and, and in Southern California that they're telling me, hey, we should really study this protein. And then I can get into this process and, and they can help me out as we try and discover a new compound. So this thermal shift assay, I thought I'd just mention it because pretty much anyone can do it. What it is, you just use an RT-PCR machine and you take a dye, Cypro Orange, uh, so a very cheap dye, and that dye will bind to your protein if your protein unfolds. And so what you do is you use your RT-PCR machine just to ramp up the temperature. You put your protein in there with a bit of dye and you go from, say, 25 to 95 degrees C and you just say, what temperature does my protein melt and the dye bind to it? And you get a nice fluorescent peak. And typically, something like 50 to 60 degrees is what you'll see your protein will melt. But it's a very particular temperature, depending on your protein. And then the nice thing is, now you can throw in your drugs. Maybe it's the FDA-approved library that you're screening. You're screening a virulence factor with an FDA-approved library and saying, does anything bind? And you can just very quickly see that, yes, something binds, because if a a small molecule binds to your protein, it will actually create some hydrogen bonds, um, have van der Waals interactions and all the rest, and that makes a clear shift in the temperature. So I can use an RT-PCR machine, 96 well or 384 well, and run, do a run typically in 15 minutes to an hour and say, screen through all my compounds. Maybe it's the 700 FDA compounds, my probably six, 700 fragment library, uh, very quickly and just say, hey, does anything bind? So I can go through my entire lab's fragment library. If I start at breakfast, I'm probably done by lunchtime. Um, and so it's a nice, nice, quick technique looking for binders. Then I get into the structural methods. And my favorite, because that's the one I'm well trained in, is crystallography. And the advantage of structural techniques is that you can see just the weakest, weakest binders. The protein concentration in a crystal is something like one millimolar or 10 millimolar. So even if compounds bind your protein at one millimolar, have a dissociation constant of one millimolar, which is terrible, you'll still see it in, 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 with the X-ray crystallography uh, with one assumption that it's binding in an ordered fashion. If it's just random sort of binding, it won't be clear to the, to the crystallographer. But it, otherwise, you can see it. And your first fragments, um, they're pretty weak binders, so it's great to use techniques like crystallography or NMR because um, you'll see them clearly. Some of your binding studies, it's kind of on the edge of binding. Um, and there's some advantages to crystallography over NMR. And one is that um, you can very quickly determine structures with crystallography, not so with NMR. And also, you get very uh, good structural models, not necessarily with NMR. But I'm not anti NMR. NMR's got a lot of good uses, uh, particularly for things like binding and so on. So I can do my thermal shift assay. I can get 50 crystals, should we say. I, well, sorry, I have 50 compound hits. And I can make, soak those into 50 crystals. Maybe I'll do 100 crystals. So I have each crystal is done twice. So I have the one fragment hit. I put it into two crystals. So now I have 100 crystals. And I send them typically to Stanford or Berkeley. Um, and I use these sort of amazing resources that are robotics-based. Um, they weren't when I was doing my postdoc. I would go to Stanford or Berkeley, and it would be 4 AM. And I'm there scooping out crystals and putting them on the beam line. And I've probably been up for, you know, a day, two days, three days, whatever it is. And now my 
grad students and postdocs, they just, you know, or they're in the lab on the laptop running robots and programming robots, telling them when to collect and all the rest. Or maybe at home, they wake up, open up the laptop and do the data collection. So they have it easy. Things have progressed. Um, but what this means is that I can sh ship up 100 crystals um, and I could shoot all of them in a typical eight-hour shift. So I can get data on my entire fragment library of all the hits very quickly. Um, sometimes there's problems with thermal shift. Um, it doesn't always work. And what I can do then is just start mixing my fragments. I could put maybe four of them together or 10 together. Because so few bind, you can just start mixing them. And I could just take my protein and mix 10 fragments. And if I'm lucky, I'll get one to bind. So I can still screen a, screen a three, 400 fragment library in just maybe 100 crystals. So it's still very viable, even if thermal shift doesn't work. There's another reason why we like fragment screening. Um, and what we're seeing is that I've got my protein, I've got the structure, I took my fragment library, I soaked them in, and I see a compound that binds. What often happens is that once the first fragment binds, it tends to open up an adjacent pocket nearby. And it's not there without the fragment, and it would be very hard to predict computationally. You wouldn't, it's a pretty tricky thing to do that, that kind of dynamics, um, um, just to predict new pockets upon fragment binding. So you get a nice experimental data uh, where your fragment will come in, bind to the pocket, reveal a new pocket, and then you can soak in your fragments here to this new pocket and see if you can couple them together. Um, or the, another approach, as well as coupling, you can actually just try and extend this fragment too. And so fragment binding often creates a second druggable pocket in which you can create a new, a new drug, um, which I think is kind of superior to some computational methods. So that was our first approach. How can we get simpler molecules um, with you know, so smaller, simple chemistry and so on? And we sort of certainly think fragments is the way ahead for that. And then so the other sort of idea, our second idea is can we get better targets? Um, and what we need to look at is dynamics and assemblies. And um, as Dr. Nize mentioned in the town hall meeting, was that we're really good at sequencing. We're really great at sequencing. And, and that was more of the discussion on sort of the clinical impact of sequencing. We get the sequencing data, but what does it actually mean? Um, but also, I think the same is actually in basic research. You know, we're really good at sequencing. We're not bad now at structural biology. We're pretty good at crystallography with the 100,000 structures in the PDB. That doesn't really reflect biology. Proteins are largely in assemblies, and they're often having complex dynamic interactions. And we're not so good at that aspect, but this is the biological aspect. This is the key component of how things uh, work. They, they come together as complexes. Um, and so now we're trying to, we and others are really trying to develop a host of techniques to understand these. You're going to have to use crystallography, but merge them with other techniques, things like electron microscopy, small angle X-ray scattering, and, and proteomics, and FRET, and all the rest. But this is where we need to be. And I think this is where we're going to get our better targets, better targets to drug. So on the dynamics front, we have um, a new software. So my lab uses typical uh, docking software for doing in silico screening. Probably my lab's favorite is Autodoc and Autodoc Vena. And the reason being is one of my friends actually is the guy that writes the code for it. So I can email him and say, hey, how do you get this to work? Um, and it's, it, it is one of the best performers out there. Uh, but then another, whoops, another colleague of mine, um, so the colleague of mine, Anton Cheltsov, um, he's spent perhaps the last 10 years in his bedroom late at night uh, with a new idea for docking. Um, and he's developed a docking tool called QMOL. And so he told me the story of QMOL and said, hey, I think I've developed this new docking software and told me about all the science behind it. And I was, it's, uh, it's a big stretch. What he's claiming to do is actually fairly significant in the structural biology field. But we started testing it and saying, OK, OK, Anton, you think you've really figured out docking. Let's see if you have. And, and one thing of note straight away is this is a library. It's the NCI DTP library. These are free compounds. There's 250,000 compounds you can get from NCI for free, and you can get them if you're in India or the US or wherever. And so we like that library because we like getting free compounds to test. Um, and so we screened the whole library against um, a target protein. And the first thing that caught our eye is that these are all the hits versus molecular weight, increasing molecular weight. And there's no obvious trend. If you normally do docking, you have a protein, and you run compounds against it and say, hey, what's going to bind? 
you typically find big molecules. The bigger your molecule is, your, your organic molecule, the better binding energy it is. That's an artifact. That shouldn't be the case. And we don't see that artifact in, in Anton. Straight away, it was like, oh, I think he might be onto something. And then at the same time, almost in the same week, as well as hearing about Cumol, a colleague of mine, a senior colleague of mine at my, my former institute at Scripps, turned around and gave me uh, his research paper and said, oh, uh, we've been collaborating on and off for a while, and said, would you, would you have a read of this? And after reading it, I pretty much sprinted back down to his lab and said, my gosh, you've just discovered and validated a novel therapeutic target for Parkinson's disease. And so we became very excited. And I said, well, hey, I've got this colleague um, who's developed Cumol. Let's take Cumol and, and try it on your target. And we're still kind of pinching ourselves because we discovered initially three and now perhaps five hit compounds, and we actually really think they're more like lead compounds. And we're seeing sub-nanomolar effects in primary neurons in terms of IC50s. Um, so really remarkable. Um, so what we don't know, so I'm working on the crystal structures right now, um, what we don't know is, is it that QMOL's really fantastic, or is it that the target's really good? Because the target has a nice, deep pocket, and so that's really good for for drug discovery, but we're certainly excited enough that we've got these lead compounds. Um, and what surprised us, if I do an in silico screen, so I do a high throughput screen, and I'm going to screen a million compounds. That's what I like. The fragment screening, well, I'll, I'll screen 500. If I do in silico screens, I'm normally going to screen something like 10,000, 20,000 compounds in the lab. That's a fair amount of work to do. Um, but with the QMOL-based screening, we've tested maybe perhaps over 100. Okay, so it's a, at least probably an order, maybe two orders of magnitude superior to other docking techniques. And we're excited because our compounds that get through the blood-brain barrier, that was deliberate in, in terms of our docking library, um, they get into the brain, they concentrate in the brain. If you give these compounds to any of the three uh, top sort of Parkinson's mouse models, they all have a very strong effect of reducing symptoms. Moreover, if we delete our novel target in mice, they get Parkinson's disease. So. We've just been trying to, uh, just right now, working on a startup, which is Neuromantis Pharmaceuticals. Can we get these, these hits, these leads, into the clinic using this new sort of dynamics-based uh, docking method? So in terms of, again, developing better targets and looking at dynamics and looking at assemblies, I'm always, as an experimentalist, I'm always a bit nervous about in silico docking. We had that QMOL result, looks great, but it's all pure theory. It's all purely made up. Um, and so I'd really rather have experimental data. And there's a new method um, called X-ray diffuse scattering. If you're a chemist, you'll probably turn around and tell me, no, it's not new. Or if you're a material scientist, you'll probably do the same and say, what are you talking about? It's been around for 50 years. But to crystallographers, we've never tried this. Since the 50s and 60s, when we've been solving crystal structures, we've just been solving the average, the average structure of the protein within the crystal. We have a new technique, um, and this is now a new grant that's starting next month. It's a UC Lab Fees grant that's between UCSD, UC Riverside, UCI, UCSF, and Lance uh, no, Los Alamos Labs. Uh, so we're excited about this big grant that we got funded. Um, and what we can do is use normal crystallographic data. We can extract the diffuse scattering data from that. And what we'll be able to experimentally to do is get an idea of the dynamics of a protein within the, a protein crystal. And that's unusual. We normally think of crystals as protein crystals being you know, a solid structure. But now it looks like we can get towards the dynamics of that, which is really going to aid us in terms of our drug discovery. So that's one exciting method. I haven't got much data to show you because it's only preliminary. And we're, ju we're just trying to start it right now. There's another method I really like a lot. And that one's small angle x-ray scattering. And so I'm a biochemist, molecular biologist by training. And I went into biophysics, so it's always quite hard work for me. <laughs> I'm always taking my time over the math and trying to figure it out if I can. Um, and in doing so, I often get surprised. And so I thought I knew a lot about crystallography. And this is my uh, postdoctoral supervisor. I went to, to his lab, and he said, oh, we're doing small angle x-ray scattering. And I'm like, great. What's that? Um, you know, and I never heard of it. You know, and I've come from a good lab for, for crystallography. Um, and it's actually been around pretty much as long as crystallography. Um, but probably why it's not as famous is that you don't get such good resolutions. You don't get your one, ang one angstrong structure. Your structure's like 10 angstrong, so it's like a low resolution technique. Um, also, this X-ray diffuse scattering, it was the same thing. It's like, great, you know, sounds amazing. What is it? I have to go and understand that too. 
Um, so I started getting into this small angle X-ray scattering, and I suddenly realized, wow, it's a really, really cool technique. Because what I'm doing, I should go back here, is here, you know, I need to grow a protein crystal to do crystallography. And actually, growing protein crystals is perhaps the hardest thing. It, it doesn't always work. It can be quite frustrating. And if you, even if you get a crystal, it doesn't mean it's a good crystal. I have my PhD student right now. We've got a new target for uh, trying to drug P53 null cancers. We've got crystals, and they look great, but they're not. And so we've been working on this for about a year, and we know if we get this structure and we got some, you know, get some compounds, my, my PhD student's going to have his PhD and a good one at that, but we're still struggling away with it, trying to get good crystals. But this technique's cool because all you do is you take your protein and put it in a quartz cuvette, and you just fire x-rays at it. No crystals are required, and you'll get a lot of useful information, even a low-resolution structure. I'm not going to go into detail of, of everything. I just wanted to give you a, a few highlights of what we could do, and that's more in the interest of time. Um, but straight away, I can just take my sample. This is a scattering curve. Um, and I can take the data and say, oh, is my protein folded or unfolded or partially folded? Is it aggregated? I can learn many, many things about my protein in solution. And um, I can even get these ab initio shape structures. Um, so these are sort of a list of the things I can do. I can say, hey, is it folded, unfolded? What is the best condition to get crystal crystals? What are the best protein constructs, buffers? Um, is it in some assembly state? I can do these high throughput structural determinations. It's, it's 96 well format. So I can send up maybe 10, 15 microliters of each sample in a 96 well plate. And I can collect all of those in maybe an hour or so and get data back of those in a few minutes. Um, and so that certainly beats low resolution EM because I've been working on low res EM structures for about three months. And now I can get 96 structures in you know, a couple of hours. Um, and so now we're developing it as a um, small molecule screen and, and, and we're thinking of things like structural systems biology. Uh, so I thought I'd just give you a few examples. So the first concern is crystallography is a high resolution technique. This small angle X-ray scattering is low resolution. That's kind of the elephant in the room. And here we have a nice structure at 13 angstrong, so pretty poor resolution. However, it differs, and it differs from electron microscopy because we have um, in black here is the experimental data, and then we have in yellow our model, our, our, no, sorry, you have our crystal structure, and it didn't fit. We were like, we have the, um, the, the structure we've solved in the crystal, and we have our experimental data, and they don't match, and it should be a perfect match. And we kept scratching our heads, it was like, why is this not the case? Um, and then we realized that, um, oh, we forgot the his tag. So you can put the his tag back in, and you get a perfect fit. So even though we're at 13 angstrom's resolution, we can still see small things like his tags, plus or minus. Um, so very useful. It's actually a higher resolution technique than you think. You can typically say, hey, what's the best protein? Maybe I'm interested in the virulence factor and I can't get it to crystallize. Well, I can look at all the homologs and see which one will. What are the best conditions for crystallography? These are crystals growing in the, growing in the sample right there. That, that is pretty cool. We can look at structures and say, um, this is from the Structural Genomics Center. They had, they're like the experts in crystallography, and they had 50 proteins they just couldn't crystallize. And we could turn around and tell them everything they needed to know pretty much. Um, about 82% of their structures tell them what the structures are, um, that they're in assembly states they never realized, and even figure out what they look like in terms of PDB structures. I started getting into it when I realized that I could start figuring out, basically getting a lot of papers, a lot of collaborations, because this is a colleague, I had his structure, he couldn't get it published because his crystal structure looked very different from a previously published EM structure, and the reviewers just weren't letting him publish. He'd done a whole panel of mutants showing that his crystal structures uh, were correct and EM was wrong, but the reviewers were just saying, no, we're not taking it. So he gives me the sample, and very quickly I can just shoot his sample and say in solution that the crystal structure is correct and the EM structure is completely wrong. Um, and so that's really exciting that we can understand all the different conformers of a protein. And what we've been using it for um, now is small molecule screening because what we can do is we can look in solution, we can take our protein, shoot x-rays at it, and then we can model in all the crystallographic data and then we can figure out how do they fit, how does a, I've got a protein, and what are the confirmations in solution? And I can clearly sort of define those confirmations using this X-ray scattering technology. So I can take 
in solution data, throw in crystal structures and figure out all of the conformers, try and figure out all the dynamics and see uh, can maybe we drag one of those conformers. We're also interested in assemblies. This is Archibacteria. We sort of, this is a colleague of mine, a long-term collaborator. He took this material and he uh, broke it apart and he found that virtually all of the proteins in sulfolobus are in aggregates, or sorry, are in complexes, so they come together and form complexes, uh, which is interesting, something we should look at in terms of bacteria. I expect most bacterial proteins are in complexes, and we could use the X-ray scattering to really sort of delineate and understand all the structures of sulfolobus, um, all their structures, and it's something we should do for bacteria as well. Um, and we're also looking at pathways. We're looking at an area called structural systems biology that we've got all the proteins in the pathway and we can start putting them together and start structurally understanding how everything comes together and interacts and, and maybe we could drug that. Um, so those are the techniques. We've got fragment screening, uh, advanced crystallography and small angle X-ray scattering. And I'll just spend a few minutes just giving some examples of what we're doing. And in particular, we're interested in the sumo and ubiquitination pathways. And here we have a protein, and it's heavily protected by these professional sumo wrestlers. So when a protein is sumulated, nothing's going to get through to it. I dare you to try and get in the middle. Um, and so this protein is protected by its sumo tags. Um, but there's another pathway, it's, its cousin, and this is ubiquitin over here, and ubiquitin is completely different. If you come into contact with ubiquitin and you're a protein, you're going to get thrown down the proteasome and degraded. And we suddenly got very interested in this pathway because uh, some clear uh, re um, ways of drugging it in terms of trying to attack undruggable uh, cancers like CMYK, NOTCH1, and KRAS. And also we're starting to realize actually sumo, uh, and certainly ubiquitin, Ubiquitin was known, but sumo is actually seems to be really important in viral infections and maybe bacterial infections. Um, so we have a pathway, it's sumo, and you have your, uh, your target here, and it uh, gets either ubiquitinated or sumulated, and it requires a couple of enzymes, an E1, an E2, and an E3, to add on the tag, your, your ubiquitin tag or your sumo tag onto, onto your protein. So you have three enzymes, E1, E2, E3, and they're involved in adding your tag, either ubiquitin or sumo. Um, and so we're wondering, can we control this pathway, this E1, E2, or E3? So lots known about the ubiquitin pathway, but the sumo pathway, not much is known. Um, ubiquitin pathway, there's something like a 1,000 E3 ligases, which is like a, a very large number of genes for, for the human genome are involved in ubiquitination, but there's only 10 in the sumulation pathway, and yet sumo does so many things, so that's a little confusing. We're not sure how that works. Um, and so I've been working on the sumo pathway, We've discovered a whole bunch of new enzymes. One of them is this uh, sumo-targeted ubiquitin ligases. Super, super hard piece of work to publish, even harder to get funded, because what it did, it actually told us we were wrong here. So sumo was protection, ubiquitination was going to get degraded, and yet we found ubiquitin ligases that would attack sumo proteins and cause them to be degraded. So virtually no one was letting us publish this. Um, but we did get to it. Uh, we did get it out, eventually in Embo Journal. It's actually my most cited manuscript. Um, and we now know this family is the therapeutic target for APL, for acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, and it's the protein that gets activated. Um, and it's actually arsenic trioxide therapy that actually activates these proteins and causes them to treat APL. And Dr. Nair was talking about Ayurvedic medicine. Actually, arsenic trioxide, that therapy, that discovery, comes from traditional Chinese medicine. So it's traditional Chinese medicine is activating these stubble proteins and allowing them to cure leukemia. If you had that type of leukemia in 1950 or 1970, you would probably die. It's probably the most lethal form of leukemia now from things like this medicine, from, from traditional Chinese medicine, it's actually the most treatable form of leukemia. And what it's doing is attacking this protein. Um, we're just also interested in another area. We found these sumo-like domains. And they're also, and it's, this is unusual. There's um, proteins that seem to have sumo inside them in the primary amino acid sequence. Um, and so that's very unusual. It's kind of hard to publish again because never been seen before. And what we found is these sumo-like domains that are present in proteins, they're actually critical for controlling DNA repair. Um, and so 
they're conserved from yeast to humans. Um, and I just wanted to point these ones out mainly for the, the bacterial people or the people working on host immune interactions. And the reason being is we don't know what the human sumo-like domain is or what it's doing, but it does seem to function as a rheostat for the type 2 immune response um, in terms of combating things like parasites. So we're trying to understand more about um, the sumulation system and particularly sumo-like domains and how they attack, uh, how they uh, sort of promote the immune system. And so just to finish up, um, what we're trying to do now is actually drug the sumo cascade. And it's really come about from working with uh, the two labs driving anacardic acid right now, uh, Bipin and Victor's labs. Um, and what we've realized is that actually anacardic acid, which we know is an MMP inhibitor and we know promotes neutrophil net formation, we know that anacardic acid um, also inhibits the sumo E1 enzyme um, and that actually would be a treatment for KRAS cancers. The sumulation pathway is used by KRAS cancers um, to, um, as, and if you knock it out, actually, it looks like data looks like it will cure KRAS cancers and also some, some drug-resistant cancers. I have a colleague that fed anacardic acid to mice that had drug-resistant AML, and it actually cured them of, of drug-resistant AML, allowed the therapy to work again. Um, and so we're very excited about that. So we're working, developing anacardic acid analogs. Um, we've got a high-throughput screening we're doing fragment-based lead discovery. And so coming to this meeting, I thought, hey, I, I should learn more about the microbial effects. And I suddenly realized, just re reading recent papers, that uh, actually inhibitors for the sumo pathway look like there would be a treatment for influenza, potentially HIV, uh, simulation pathway. If you knock that out, HIV gets 10 times less infectious, and certainly Ebola virus as well, um, and I'm trying to understand more. Certainly there's bacterial species that seem to clearly function by controlling the sumo simulation pathway, um, such as uh, Shigella and your senior species and so on. So I'd like to acknowledge my lab. These are the senior members of my lab. Um, I also have about 15 uh, undergraduates working in my lab. I've stolen the university honors program and put them in, in my lab. Um, they're doing some wonderful work, uh, ongoing collaborations, a new collaboration on SPB with Victor and also Kang Zhang for the cataract stuff. Uh, I'd like to thank Bipin. Uh, I need to thank the UC system. Uh, the UC system pretty much is paying for all of my research. It's my startup um, and this big lab fees grant and, and a seed grant. And they also helped the UCSD help uh, the birth of baby Ethan. Uh, my lab calls him Dr. Ethan because whenever I Skype, if I'm away from the lab and I'm at home working, I Skype and Ethan insists on coming along and giving his comments to the lab. Um, <laughs> um, and the other reason we're having a bit of fun with him is actually slightly more serious, is that when he was born, actually he had an infection around his umbilical cord. And it was the, the pediatricians in the audience will tell me what it was. It was a flame-like infection around the umbilical cord. And luckily for us, as they quickly treated him with antibiotics and the, and the infection went away, but they were keen to do it quickly because they said, hey, if, you know, if we don't treat this, there's a, you know, a good chance of sepsis actually occurring. And so, you know, we're great, we're lucky. I was in San Diego with where we're not having that antibiotic resistance, but I'm, I'm really concerned if something like that happened, you know, if we now get to the stage that the baby's born and then you have the infection and, and we don't have an antibiotic to, to treat it. But Baby Ethan, he's happy and very healthy. So, thank you. I threw a lot at you and very quickly. Have you got any example of uh, the recruitment target being used for cancer therapy. Have you got a candidate molecule based on that? Not for cancer, but our Parkinson's disease therapy is a ubiquitin E3 ligase that we've, that we've targeted specifically. Well, Parkinson anyway has to involve the dopamine dopa axis. It's a so novel pathway that we've got, and it's actually um, to do with um, oxidative stress, and we're stabilizing um, an anti-apoptotic molecule. Um, so, you know, that's our, our theory. It goes against in, uh, in terms of protein aggregates causing problems. It's actually, for us, it's quite clearly oxidative stress is the problem. And what about the stability of most of these proteins that you're talking about in terms of drugability? 
Um, so the SUMA pathway is interesting because you have maybe 1% of the proteins sumulated, and yet somehow that 1% totally changed the activity of the protein. And that's a bit of an enigma in terms of how the simulation pathway works. So it's a really astute question. Um, but what we're doing is actually just going for the machinery itself. Um, so it looks like in certain cancers that uh, they function by hypersumulation. And so if we can knock out the machinery itself, then, then we lose that hypersumulation, and actually then the, the cancer actually tends to apoptose. Anything on amyloid protein, amyloid plaques? Not right now, actually, on the opposite side, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, oxidative, oxidative damage and so on. Um, but I was thinking of using the X-ray scattering screen um, because you can see aggregates very, very clearly when you're doing small angle X-ray scattering. So I was thinking of using the small angle X-ray scattering screen uh, to quickly look for, for inhibitors that could start breaking up aggregates. And get, you actually get structural information, like all the changes, what's actually happening. Say that again, sorry. We're working on it right now. So I have a, a natural product chemist at UCR, um, and so we're trying to develop them. We'd also like to give them to Victor's lab and, and Bippin's lab and to see, you know, well obviously we're designing them for the Sumo E1, but they certainly may have effects against other known targets. The only concern is uh, IP. They're just going to say, uh, you know, there's prior art here. We already know that anacardic acid is... Derivatives, yeah, and hopefully quite far away. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, that. So we're definitely focusing on the derivatives. But but I did have this colleague that literally fed my, mice mice model of um, drug resistant AML, and he actually gave them anacardic acid, and, and it did work to to knock out the sumo pathway and allow for the the drug treatment to actually, you know, actually start working again. It's a poor drug. It's got such a long aliphatic tail. It's a really poor drug. And actually, the poor mice they had lots of sort of precipitation and nasty things going on in their stomach because of, uh, of the anacardic acid. So we need to make something much more drug-like. I hope it doesn't go in the curcumin way. This, uh, 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 what are the constants or IC50s of uh, three or four uh, inhibitory activity of anacardic acid which you are seeing? Which one tops the list? Sorry, sorry again. So we've got the... The anacardic acid and the IC50s and with the four or five target which I've already indicated. Which so ones are which, hitting? Which are, the, which are on the top? Um, so certainly, but I understand that one of the anacardic acids hitting the sumo E1, that's a, that's a key component within the cell. But I mean, Bipin certainly might argue outside the cell, it could be the MMPs, uh, probably just as important. So it, that's the other issue with natural products is, you know, they're not just hitting one target. So how can you alter them to actually achieve target specificity? And so that's why we're trying to bring in chemistry to do that. Exactly, or combine them, <laughs> yeah. Thank you.